Hello, welcome back to the channel. Today, I wanna to answer the question, should scientific fraud be a criminal offense? So why am I talking about this? Well, as I have discussed in previous videos and demonstrated through many different case studies on this channel, the problem of scientific misconduct is far more common than most people are aware of. Scientific misconduct and scientific fraud is not a niche issue. It is not limited to only a small number of people or limited to a specific field. It is a system-wide and ever-growing problem that occurs in basically every single field of scientific inquiry. And the perpetrators of scientific fraud range anywhere from struggling PhD students all the way through to Harvard professors and Nobel Prize winners. And so the question is, when we catch these people committing scientific fraud, faking their data, faking their scientific research, should these people be put in jail? Certainly, a lot of you guys in my comments section think so, but the reality of the situation is, is that the vast majority of the people who commit scientific fraud are firstly not caught, and secondly, if they are caught, most of them get away with it with just a very light slap on the wrist. Maybe they have to retract a paper or two. In very rare cases, do these people actually lose their job? And quite often we find a lot of researchers, especially the rich and powerful ones, who keep their jobs at their university, continue to earn big professor money, continue to benefit off the fame that they gained while committing fraudulent research, and continue to often be on the board of directors for you know, very high paying, biomedical research companies if they work in the field of medicine. So does that feel right to you that somebody should continue to benefit from the fame and prestige that they have gained at least partially through fraudulent research? Now there's a blog post about this that I want to share with you in a second but before we get to that let's talk about you know what is the current legal status of scientific misconduct in the United States and in the UK. Now a caveat is that I'm not a lawyer or a legal expert in any shape or form but from my understanding scientific fraud is not automatically a criminal offense Instead, the law mainly pertains to how that scientific research was funded and if there was any kind of fraudulent or false claims being made at the point of funding. So if, for example, a scientist was to make a false claim in order to secure certain amounts of research funding for their research, then that would be considered a criminal offence. But if they've already been funded in a totally legitimate way, but then during the course of the study and by the end of the study, they produced a completely fraudulent paper, that is not a criminal offense as long as the source of funding was gained legitimately. In some cases, there can be greater repercussions if that particular scientist's research led to a significant amount of public harm. We saw that in the case of Andrew Wakefield, the guy who did the original autism vaccine study, that because that study was so harmful and continues to be so harmful to this day, that his medical license was was revoked. But as far as I know, Andrew Wakefield did not serve any jail time for this particular offense. So to explore this topic a bit further, I want to share with you a blog post that I read earlier this week from a guy called Chris Said, who says that he is a data scientist at Propel. And he wrote a blog post called The Case for Criminalizing Scientific Misconduct. And to me, I think he makes a pretty compelling argument that I wanted to share with you today. So Chris opens this blog post with what I think is a very poignant case study, which is the case study of a 2006 paper written by a French scientist called Sylvain Lesnay, who is a neuroscientist who looks into Alzheimer's research, and he's currently a professor at the University of Minnesota. The reason why Chris is talking about this particular paper from Simon Lesnay is because this paper was published in Nature, which, as you might know, is one of the most influential journals in the world. And this paper was one of the most cited papers in all of Alzheimer's research. Chris says it was the fourth most cited study in all of Alzheimer's basic research. And the reason why it was so heavily cited is because it proposed a totally new hypothesis for what causes Alzheimer's, which was the amyloid oligomers hypothesis. Basically, this paper claimed that amyloid oligomers caused Alzheimer's disease, which generated a lot of interest from the Alzheimer's research community. And according to Chris's blog, since this paper came out in 2006, 287 million US dollars have been spent into researching the oligoma hypothesis based off this paper. However, 16 years later, after that paper was published, it's been found that many of the images used as evidence in that paper were actually faked. So what about the oligoma hypothesis that came off the back of it? Well, it turns out 287 million US dollars were spent disproving this paper's hypothesis because the oligoma hypothesis has failed every single clinical trial. So the argument that Chris is making is that this paper from Lesney and his colleagues misled the field of Alzheimer's research for over 15 years. And sure, there were a few other papers that were supporting the oligoma hypothesis, but 
At the end of the day, the most robust clinical trials showed that this hypothesis was false. And so Chris makes the argument that not only is this a massive waste of research's time and a massive waste of money, 287 million US dollars worth of research money, but actually the problem is much more serious than that because if all of these resources are wasted chasing a red herring that turned out to be fraudulent from the get-go, then that means that those research dollars are not being put towards an actual legitimate cure. So Chris makes the argument that all of these wasted resources could have resulted in the cure for Alzheimer's being delayed by at least one year and he estimates that just just delaying the cure for Alzheimer's by one year would lead to a loss of 36 million quality adjusted life years, which is you know a measurement of the societal impact of a particular thing, which he says is more quality adjusted life years that were lost by Americans in all of World War II. And he says that Lesne is not the only example. And you guys know if you're fans of this channel that Lesne is definitely not the only example. The other example that he talks about in his blog is the recent cancer scandal involving the Dana Farber Institute, another institute associated with Harvard University. That institute had a major problem with image manipulation. It's had six papers retracted and 31 corrected and again Chris makes the argument that all of this fraudulent research has polluted the field wasted a lot of people's time wasted a lot of people's money and potentially has delayed successful treatments and cures for cancer and so by his estimates he says that this could have led to a loss of around 15 million quality adjusted life years which is still a heck of a lot of quality adjusted life years. Now we could debate whether Chris's calculations on quality adjusted life years is correct till the cows come home but I think the important thing to take away from Chris's message here is the overarching theme which is that fraudulent research has a really significant impact on people's lives and if it delays scientific progress that means it's actually delaying the progress of society which is actually making society worse. The only people who benefit from creating fraudulent research are the researchers and the university who profit from the fame of those researchers working for them. And this is a point that I've tried to make to many of you guys in my comment section who say things like, oh, it doesn't matter if there's a bunch of fraudulent research because replication will prove what's true and what's not. And it's nearly always somebody who works in academia who is making that comment because people who work in academia and who don't work in the real world often don't have a very strong understanding that wasting money and time is actually a very important thing in the real world outside of university. Spending intelligent researchers time and limited money on replicating fraudulent research is a massive waste of resources and is not something Thing that should be swept under the rug or seen as a actual solution to this problem. So Chris goes on to make a very similar point to how I did in the intro to this video, that the vast majority of scientific researchers who commit scientific misconduct are never caught and the ones who are caught generally don't suffer any major consequences. Lesne, for example, still holds his professor position at the University of Minnesota, completely unaffected by this massive scandal. So how come the few fraudulent researchers who do get caught doing the fraud don't suffer major consequences? Well, like I said earlier, it's partially because the law doesn't really mean that what they did is a criminal offense. If they committed the fraud after securing funding legitimately, that's generally not seen as a criminal offense. And it only gets a little bit more dicey if the result of that research has led to a significant amount of public harm, which is a pretty difficult thing to prove. And the other reasons which Chris focuses on in his blog are the massive conflicts of interest that exist within the academic system. Firstly, the universities have very poor incentives to punish their researchers when it comes to scientific misconduct. Top scientific researchers who are famous bring in millions of dollars in research funding for the university. That is why, like I said in previous videos, Harvard University used to have a culture where they encourage their professors to try and get their name on as many different papers as possible, even if their involvement in that paper was absolutely minuscule or virtually nothing. And the reason why they did that was because that means that their researchers can get their name on more papers, which means that they get more citations, which raises their prestige, which by association raises the prestige of Harvard University even more. Every university wants to have the most cited, most prolific scientists working under their name. And so the incentive to punish one of your top scientists who got caught committing fraud is like trying to punish your star football player in your football team when they are caught doing something a bit dodgy. The incentives in that regard are just completely misaligned. Chris doesn't talk about this in his blog, but I also think that many universities are obviously run by academics and academics have a lot of the attitude that people in my comment section have who are academics, which is that, oh, it doesn't matter because it'll all get proven through replication anyway, which like I just said, is a major problem and is not a solution to why fraud is a problem. Similarly, academic journals are not very highly incentivized to correct the record 
record either. Elizabeth Bick will tell you all about this. If you don't know, Elizabeth Bick is somebody who full-time investigates image manipulation and scientific misconduct and she has literally submitted hundreds and hundreds of these cases to different journals around the world and the vast vast majority of them receive no action off the back of her observations. The truth is if you run a journal your main focus is to try and get the best most interesting papers printed into your journal so that you can sell more journals or have more people look at ads on your website and so on and so forth. So journals really don't have that strong an incentive to correct the record because all correcting the record does is just show that they weren't very careful when they published that paper in the first place, which only serves to hurt their reputation. So what is the solution? Well, Chris argues that the USA should adopt something of the Danish model. The Danish model, apparently in Denmark in 2017, the Danish government set up an independent scientific misconduct committee who looks into scientific misconduct independent of in-house investigations conducted by universities and journals. The independence of this committee I think is absolutely key and we can't rely on Elizabeth Bick to catch absolutely everything that's out there. Committees like this set up by government I think is absolutely essential for fixing this problem. Now the Danish committee as far as I can tell only has quite limited power but they can at least notify people. They can investigate these things, notify the university that the professor works at, notify the journal Journal, and in some cases even notify the police. They can't actually prosecute anybody or put anybody in jail for the things that they find, but at least by being an independent committee that is specifically looking at scientific misconduct and scientific fraud, then they can at least provide a very objective view as to whether scientific fraud has taken place. But not only should there be an independent committee set up, but there should also be changes made to the law, Chris argues. Chris mentions a lawyer called Susan Kuzma, who is a lawyer for the Department of Justice, and she proposed is that a new criminal statute directed explicitly at scientific misconduct should be established. The most important advantage being that if scientific fraud has been committed, then that would be a criminal offence. Not just if scientific fraud was committed in order to secure grant funding or other types of funding, but just if you publish a paper with fake stuff in it, it's a criminal offence. Finally, Chris also has a section which is response to criticisms. And so I am going to preemptively respond to your comments based off this section of his blog, assuming that many of you are probably sharing some of these thoughts as well. So there are three main criticisms of why we shouldn't criminalize scientific misconduct. The first one is that people say, well, fraudsters are fraudsters. These people are bad people making it a criminal offence is not going to stop them because these are bad people who are basically criminals anyway. I think that that's a stupid argument. I think that people respond to incentives and currently the incentives are very much in favour of committing scientific fraud with very little chance of repercussions and negative things happening to you. I think we should balance out that equation a lot more. If you're cheating, if you're faking your research, that should be a criminal offence. That makes the risk of committing fraud a lot higher, which means that that will disincentivize a lot of people from doing it, which will only benefit the system. Other people worry that this kind of criminalization of scientific research could lead to murkier, sort of more gray areas of scientific misconduct also being persecuted or being prosecuted as criminal offences. And I agree that this could be a problem, right? There are many aspects of scientific misconduct that are a little bit more gray things like p-hacking, for example. It is debatable about how bad or an impact that has on the scientific community. Arguably, it has an even greater negative impact on the scientific record because of the volume of it that occurs within the scientific community. However, sometimes it does occur accidentally and researchers will honestly make these kind of mistakes and so should that be also criminalized it certainly doesn't seem like as bad an offense on the face of it and so in order to get around this it would mean that whoever's the very clever person who writes this law would have to be very specific about what types of scientific misconduct constitute a criminal prosecution and jail time versus other types of scientific misconduct that you know are a little bit more gray and murky and the final argument is well what happens if there are researchers who mistakenly get accused of scientific fraud right isn't that very unfair on them and yeah of course it's super unfair on them but guess what that's the case with every other kind of crime as well people go to jail all the time for murders that they didn't commit and that is obviously a terrible situation and something that we don't want to happen to anyone but does that mean that we should make murder legal as a result obviously not and so in the same way the net benefit to society of making the consequences of committing scientific fraud much higher seem at least to me to outweigh the potential risk that somebody could actually accidentally be prosecuted for something that they didn't do. So that's the case for why we should criminalize 
minimize scientific misconduct. Do you agree, disagree? Let me know in the comments below. I want to say a massive thank you to Chris Sade for his very well written, very thought provoking article that I used as my main source for this video. I'll have a link to his blog post in the description below. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye bye.